Welcome to History of Economic Thought 2. Today I'm uh, recording from the uh, quarantine uh, headquarters, bunker, whatever we call it. And uh, you'll notice that I'm wearing my NYU colors. I've got the uh, violet shirt and the white tie. There's a reason for that, as we'll see, but we will uh, get to that. I'm going to pick up where we left off last time. We were speaking about factor pricing, the theory of distribution. We had had the work of John Bates Clark, uh, Wicksteed, Wicksell, and, and uh, what they concluded was that factors of production will earn their marginal products. Wicksell, uh, sorry, uh, Clark shows that under these, you know, entrepreneurs competing will drive the price to the to the uh, marginal product, to the value of the marginal product for these things. They will earn their return, and that way we know that resources will be directed to where they will create the most value, the highest marginal product. Uh, Wixell shows that this holds in competitive equilibrium. This is important, so there it is. We have the perfectly competitive equilibrium. Comp competition will take us to this, and hang on a second. What, in it, what, what permits us to go from competition to perfect competition? Have we slipped something in that maybe wasn't quite legitimate? What do we mean by competition? Well, I'm going to cover competition in two lectures. And the first one is going to be material that you will not find in any textbook. And yet it's Im quite important for our understanding of competition. So that'll be our p lecture part one. In a separate lecture, we will also cover competition, perfect competition versus monopolistic competition. Uh, but let's start with, with our uh, topic for today. Now, this one's not going to be technical in the sense of there won't be mathematics, there won't be a lot of graphs and modeling and things. And yet, sometimes students get lost with it because there's a debate going on. There are two different sides. You need to keep them straight. And so maybe the easiest way to say this is, this is not this is, this is good enough. This is a debate between the University of Chicago and New York University, or between viewpoints that originate in those two places on the history of competition theory. So let's start out and talk about what we mean. Well, first, what is competition? What, what do we mean by it? If you think of a business, a firm, trying to compete with, uh, with other, other firms in its market, what do you suppose they would do? Um, I suppose they would uh, try to cut their prices. They might try to find a better product, make their product superior. They might advertise, uh, do all sorts of things to attract business away from their competitors. They might go for a bigger market share, cutting price, something. Many different things, strategies they might try. Um, yikes. <laughs> uh, well, what do we mean? Uh, what is perfect competition? Huh, let's, let's think about that. Um, my goodness, where's my eraser? There it is. Perfect competition. What do we mean by that? Perfect competition is the idea that, well, what are the characteristics of perfect competition? Well, one would be a homogeneous product. What do we mean by Homogeneous product, it means that everybody is selling the same thing. Well, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, for example, wheat. Uh, the wheat from one farm was probably about the same as the wheat from the farm next to it. Okay, everybody's selling wheat. Wheat is wheat. Uh, what other things would we find in a perfectly competitive market? What are the characteristics? How about many buyers and sellers, okay? This is a thickly traded market, lots of people in it, both buying and selling. That would be a, a characteristic. What else goes in, in here? How about something like perfect information? Or maybe a little more precisely, we'll put perfect information. Or we could also say complete information. Complete information technically is a comp, is, is a concept which would allow there to be a little bit of uncertainty in the sense of like probabilistic uncertainty or something. Complete info, okay. Um, sometimes under this 
heading, we will also put a zero transaction cost or costless transacting. We'll kind of fit in there. Well, what this means is that by perfect information, the buyers and sellers know what all the buying and selling opportunities are. So for example, if there were many buyers and many sellers, but the buyers only knew about one of the sellers, they would, maybe he could act as if it's a monopoly situation until the uh, buyers figure out there are other places where they can buy. So they all have the same information and it's, you know, we know all the buying and selling oppor uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, what are the characteristics for a perfectly competitive market? Oh, how about free entry and exit? And uh, perhaps something like we'd even say price taking behavior. Everyone is a price taker in this market. Everyone is a tiny little bit of the market uh, so that they can't, they can't buy or sell enough to influence the price or hold back from doing so. And uh, really price taking is a consequence of these, other, of these other characteristics, but we'll put it down separately. And uh, that's interesting. Because when I laid out the first story of what competition is, the business is trying to beat each other with better product and lower prices and doing all kinds of advertising and things like this to persuade consumers. None of that fits on there. That kind of competition, that rivalry, doesn't seem to fit here. They may be two different things. Now there's a textbook, I've never used it, but I, it was, I took a look at it one time. Uh, it was sent to me for, as an examination copy and I was reading through it and it cut to the section on competition. It said, firms cutting prices and doing all these things, that's the layman's version of uh, competition. But econ economics is a science, it needs a scientific precise definition. And so we have dismissed all that nonsense and there's the definition of that's what competition means. <laughs> well, I just missed that book. Uh, it's gone. I never used it. Uh, but, but that raises a really interesting and important question. What is competition and what does the market do? Well, what's the history of competition? And the definitive history of competition theory comes from George Stiegler. George Stiegler, I'll put him here great Chicago economist, and when I say great, truly a great economist, he lived, excuse me, <laughs> back. Uh, if Marco Rubio can do that with water, I can do it with my notes. Uh, he, um, what, 1911 to 1991, University of Chicago. But in 1957, he published an essay, Perfect Competition, Historically Contemplated. This is the definitive story of competition theory, and his story begins with modern economics being founded by, as he says, Adam Smith. And he says, Smith started this idea. He said, Smith was thinking of perfect competition. He had this in mind. That's what he's about. But Smith is groping for it, but he doesn't have the technical tools nor the sophistication to really state it, to explain it. But that's what he's thinking of. And so the idea develops. And a crucial point in that development is when we get to Auguste Antoine Cournot, the Frenchman. Because Cournot is the first one to lay out the perfectly elastic demand curve facing the firm for its product. Think back to the Cournot model that we worked through. If you don't remember, the notes for that are on Blackboard. There's a handout there. Notice that when N goes to infinity, the firm is charging the marginal cost of production, the marginal cost being in the Cournot model zero. If you put in a marginal cost of, that's positive, that's what the firm will charge. But the firm simply pays that, or sorry, simply charges that. That's the f demand curve for the firm's product. So Cournot is a crucial step in the development of perfect competition in his story. And that develops further through Edgeworth, Edgeworth works on this problem, but the great achievement comes from Frank Knight, Stiegler's story. Frank Knight, who ends up at University of Chicago, a great economist, very famous. And Knight was the 
He was an instructor for Stiegler, for Milton Friedman, for James Buchanan, for many of the greatest economists in all of history. They're students of Frank Knight at University of Chicago. He also taught at University of Iowa. Well, Knight completes the theory because Frank Knight, who lived 1885 to 1972, uh, he laid out the basic model, the modern version of perfect competition. Arbitrarily, many firms and buyers, that is just lots, a homogeneous product, perfect information about buying and selling opportunities so that there's no bargaining, no holdouts, there it is, and then freedom of entry and exit, that gets you the price-taking behavior and guarantees, bang, you're in equilibrium with a single price. So that's the story. And uh, everyone, he writes that up, lays that history out, everybody agrees. That's the history of competition. But hang on a second, there's a problem with that. Because think of what the implications of, the, of, of this would be or, or of perfect competition. First of all, everybody is charging the same price and so nobody undercuts. They're all saving, selling the same product. So there's no differentiation. Advertising is pointless. There's no entrepreneurship and no profit. Um, well, that seems so strange. What's all this stuff going on in the market then? Um, I wonder if this story is really right. Well, I'm not the first person to ask that question because that's a standard account, but maybe it's wrong. What would be an alternative to perfect competition? And that alternative would be something that we might call rivalrous competition. And rivalrous competition is something very different. That's firms seeking advantages over each other, whether it's in price, quantity, quality, something like that, changing the information set for consumers, trying to attract business. It's a very different act, kind of activity. Well, uh, that activity is not compatible with a perfectly competitive equilibrium. Well, a gentleman by the name of Frank Machovic An economist. I don't have his dates. He's uh, still a professor today. I believe he's at Wofford College, South Carolina. Uh, he was a student at New York University under Israel Kirzner. Kirzner, of course, has done important work in history of economic thought. When well, Machovic became interested in this question and decided to write his doctoral dissertation on the history of economic thought of competition theory and re-examine what Stiegler had done. And Machovic comes to some interesting conclusions. And first of all, the orthodoxy of per perfect competition is something that is new. Prior to Knight and Edgeworth, both of whom built on Cournot, almost all economists believed in rivalrous competition, not perfect competition. Stiegler's history is really about a very small subset of mathematical economics or mathematical economists from Cournot onward who were trying to describe not competition, but equilibrium. And it's an unwarranted, in Bachovic's story, it's an unwarranted historical and rational reconstruction to attribute perfect competition to Smith, to Ricardo, to Mill, to Marshall, to Clark, and that Stiegler and Friedman and others have made a grave error in this. So here's the evidence for that. Machovic, first of all, consults the work of Shorey Peterson. Shorey Peterson was a professor at University of Michigan, actually uh, somewhat famous in his time. He is deceased some, some time ago, but Shorey Peterson uh, was a student of John Bates Clark. And he said, I was there as a graduate student in the 1920s. Clark did not believe in perfect competition. He believed in workable competition, and that's different. In workable competition, firms were taking action to beat each other. It was rivalrous. Everyone believed in rivalrous competition, and that was the sense of Clark, that was the sense of Marshall, and Marshall's models aren't models of competition 
his partial equilibrium models. They're models of the end state that competition would take you to, that is, equilibrium. There's a note, more of Machovic's evidence uh, comes from a, a man by the name of Paul McNulty. He was a professor at Columbia University. Paul McNulty argued that rivalrous competition and perfect competition are two entirely different things. Cournot changed the definition of competition when he said that his model was, competi was competitive and nobody really paid attention and realized it. Prior to Knight and Edgeworth, everyone thought of competition as being this rivalrous process. Both Peterson and McNulty say, also say that two other people that we will talk about later, uh, Joan Robinson and Edward Chamberlain, created perfect competition as an orthodoxy in order to knock it down as a straw man for their models of monopolistic competition and imperfect competition. But all the classical economists, according to both of them, thought that competition was a process of people trying to higgle and bargain and change products and do all those kinds of things in rivalry. So what Marshall and Walras, when they describe their their competitive models really are just statements of equilibrium, not any sort of competition or something like that. They think that that's where the invisible hand of competition will take us. Now you might say, uh-huh, well, who's right? And the evidence seems to come down, well, you can see what colors I'm wearing. Um, evidence seems to come down on the side of NYU in this one. And the story that rivalrous competition and perfect competition are two different things. Put this back up here. There are two different things, and that if we want to think of these things carefully, maybe the right understanding is that the rivalrous competitive process would take us to a perfectly competitive equilibrium if it worked itself out. This is the way I think of it, and I think it's the way that you should think of it. Now, does that really matter? Well, another of my Marco Rubio steps. Um, if you think that per equilibrium is the best description of competition in the market, then remember that you're almost never going to see competitive equilibrium. The conditions of perfectly competitive equilibrium almost never exist. I mean, there is the wheat market, but then, well, hang on, a homogeneous product. How many kinds of wheat are there? The USDA recognizes 60 different kinds of wheat, but in the private market, it's more than that. Wheat is not wheat. Now, Pagu and people, economists like Pagu or Paul Samuelson will look and say, well, we can't achieve perfect competition uh, therefore, the market has failed and the government must intervene. Uh, Milton Friedman will say, look, it's, it's, it's just a model. It's a, an approximation used to predict. It's the assumptions. It, it, they can be wildly uh, unrealistic or they can be wrong, but it predicts nicely. Um, but remember that most of what businesses do to compete has often been called anti-competitive. Advertising has been considered anti-competitive and wasteful. People try to say maybe we should ban it. Changing products? Nobody needs, what, what is it, 12 brands of deodorant while ch children are hungry, to quote the great comrade uh, Sanders. Uh, well, if you think that the market is a setting in which rivalrous competition can occur and discover things, discover what nobody knows, then that's pretty important. If you think that competition is simply a set of circumstances that you meet and therefore it's efficient, it's a very different thing. Here's another example. I was listening to Rush Limbaugh one time and Rush Limbaugh was talking about healthcare reform. And of course, proposing that we need a free market in healthcare. Well, somebody called a caller called in and said, Limbaugh, you're all wrong. 
and here's why. And he went through the conditions of perfect competition, and he said, this can never be achieved in, a, in, a, in healthcare because you have asymmetric information and freedom of entry and exit. How can you have that with the sellers? And how can you have uh, perfect information? None of that stuff is, is, is met in healthcare. Therefore, government must take over. The market can't do it. Rush Limbaugh had to sidestep that. He couldn't answer that question. Uh, he, he, of course, attacked, uh, fought, him, fought back on other grounds. But rival risk competition, if that's what the market does, then that's not a valid criticism. Of course, no market has uh, achieves those perfectly competitive uh, conditions. So this actually matters quite a bit. Um, so this is why Austrians, with their emphasis on uncertainty inherent in human action, become the center of a minority viewpoint that forces or that emphasizes this rivalrous process view. Hayek points this out. The market is a process of discovering and then communicating knowledge, things that we don't know. It's not that you just look at the price and then you know what to do. You don't know. You discover things and you act and that changes the prices and sends signals to other people. Israel Kirzner develops a formal theory of entrepreneurship. Mises says that entrepreneurship is the driving force of the market. It's that act of discovery. And all of these alleged market failures are not failures at all, or else they are profitable opportunities, either for uh, developing new kinds of property rights, for developing new kinds of products, or for pushing the market towards something that's better. So that's why that makes a difference. And again, when we get to an economy where we eliminate that rival risk competition, we'll see what happens and how that affects it. That's the end of part one. When we return, we will talk about perfect competition versus monopolistic competition. <laughs>